Grace Bible Church Pearlside Online. In the story of our lives, how is it possible to move forward in God's victory when we remain tethered to our past? Pastor Kalai George reveals how God's plans for your future aren't dependent upon your failures. In his message, Turn the Page, part one of our series, Storytellers, Our Story, His Glory. Chapter 22, verse 31 to 34, it says this, Simon, Simon, this is Jesus speaking, Satan has asked to sift you, sift all of you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. You see here in this context that Jesus doesn't prevent us from experiencing pain in our lives, but he prays for us that in, in our pain, he prays for us in our pain that, you know, he prays that, you know, you, you might fail, but I'm praying that your faith may, might not fail. And I think for many of us in life, we, we think that Jesus wants to prevent us from experiencing pain. No, Jesus doesn't uh, want us to be free from pain, but he actually wants us to learn more about him, even in the midst of our pain. And continue on, it says this, and when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times that you know me. Jesus makes a prediction over Peter's life and how his story is going to begin to unfold. He makes a, a prediction that you're going to mess up. You're going to mess this thing up. But the, attached to the prediction was also a promise that you are going to turn back, meaning you are going to bounce back from that failure in your life. And that's the kind of God that we serve, that even in the midst of our failures, he already predicts and promises a bounce back in our lives. So let's pray tonight. God, we thank you so much for this word. God, we thank you for your heart. God, even in a room of many, Lord, you see us as individuals. God, and I pray, Lord, that you would reveal yourself to us tonight. Speak to our hearts, God. We thank you, Lord, that you love us, that you have a plan and a purpose for our lives. God, we thank you, Lord, that you're constantly moving. And Lord, you know every single situation. And God, we pray that we will leave here with a better understanding of who you are in our lives. God, we thank you that you're a good, good father. It's who you are. And we are loved by you, God. And so, Lord, help us to understand this love. In your beautiful name we pray. Amen and amen. Title of my message tonight is Turn the Page. Turn the Page. Um, I, I, how many of you like movies? Any big movie fans? You know, get the Fury 7 out. It's a great movie. And I was uh, looking up different movies because I think movies are like one of the better ways to actually tell a story. And so I was thinking about uh, different top movies. And so I was Googling a, a bunch of different uh, top movies of 1990s and the, the 2000s. And I looked at all of these lists and I didn't like the movies that they had on the list. I kind of was like, no, I don't think that's like my personal favorite. And so I kind of put together a list of my own uh, favorite movies. And this might not be your favorite movies, but this is mine. So don't be judging my list, okay? It's just my personal favorites. You might have yours. I don't care. We, we're different. But this is some of mine. So the first movie that I think is a pretty good movie is the movie The Dark Knight. I think if you ever uh, watched this movie, The Dark Knight, is Really good movie. Uh, Heath Ledger really plays uh, an amazing role uh, as the Joker. It's so sad that his life ended, but I had a, a toss up between The Dark Knight and Inception because I think both movies are legit, and any movie directed by Christopher Nolan is a legit movie. So I thought Dark Knight, man, it was kind of up there. I can watch that movie a lot. The, the next movie on my list I thought was a pretty good movie that I can find myself watching a lot is Gladiator. I mean, it's just like a good gladiator movie, you know? It's just like, you don't need any explanation. This is a legit movie. If you haven't seen it, something is wrong with you. Like, seriously, where have you been all these years? Gladiator, great movie. Russell Crowe, per uh, perfect actor. I, I think another good movie is, uh, you got to have one for kids, you know? You can't just be watching all this stuff. You got to have a kid-friendly movie. My favorite kid-friendly movie is Up. I just think this movie is awesome, but I thought, I think that the beginning part of the movie is the best part. There's like a scene, an entire story unfolds with no words, and it'll bring you to tears. Like just the beginning part, the introduction of the movie up, like if you watch that, like you get teary-eyed. Just a, and a relationship unfolding without even words. And I thought, man, that's a, an amazing story up. How many of you like the movie up? It's one of my favorite movies, better than Frozen. Hello, somebody. Come on now. <laughs> I just started preaching right there. Um, next movie that, you know, you kind of got to have a, a romantic comedy. I think one of my favorite romantic comedies is 500 Days of Summer. 
Some of you are like, what? Don't judge my movies. I told you this is my list, okay? I, I, I think this story is, is, uh, is pretty awesome. Not only the fact of the story, but the way they filmed this story. It's like they went through an entire 500 days. It goes back and forth. Uh, and the way that they tell the cinematography in this movie is pretty unreal. And my favorite part is the ending because you always got to have a story with a twist, right? And so this girl, uh, Summer, played by Zoe Deschanel, which is kind of, hey, hey, she bae. Favorite show, new girl. Watch it on Fox. Uh, uh, but, it, you know, I was watching this and it made you like, have a love-hate relationship with this girl. It's Summer, like, man, she was just playing with this guy. But my best, the best part of the movie was the ending. If you haven't watched it, I'm going to spoil it for you right now. So he had this thing with this girl named Summer, and at the end, he meets a girl named Autumn. And I was like, oh, snap. It's crazy. I just ruined it for you. Pray for forgiveness. Come on. Don't hold bitterness in church tonight. Uh, and then so I thought, man, that's a good romantic comedy. I even also like... Um, uh, serendipity is up, up, up there too, but it didn't make the list, you know, it's like probably number six. And the last one, you always got to have just like a guilty pleasure movie. My favorite guilty pleasure movie is uh, Nacho Libre. <laughs> Did you not know I have had diarrhea since Easter's? Oh, and sweats. You got to have the sweats. You know, I, I, I like different movies, and maybe you have your own list and your own favorite movies, and the thing I like about stories is that it really is something that we, we are gravitate towards. We like hearing a good story. We like the plots and the twists. We like the, the epic points. We even like the valleys in the stories, and I think about the greatest story ever told is what we celebrated last week, is the fact that Jesus Christ, uh, the God of the universe, came down in flesh to not only live amongst us, but also to die on our behalf, and when we put our faith in him, we actually have an opportunity to experience life and life abundantly. And that's the greatest story ever told. There's no story that comes even close to the resurrection story and the fact that this God of the universe loves us so much that he actually gave his life so that we can experience life. That's the gospel. And that's the greatest story ever told. And that's a story that we're going to begin to unfold. And we as believers, this is a story that we need to begin to tell people. The world needs to hear about this amazing story. And the thing I love about God is that he knows this is a great story, but before we can actually start to tell his story, he needs to actually shape our own personal stories. And this is where we pick up this scene with Peter. So Jesus resurrects, he uh, comes back from the dead. I'm, I'm glad that the tomb is still empty. And so if you're feeling down today, just remind yourself that Jesus is still alive, he's not dead. And after he resurrected, for 40 days he began to appear and reveal himself to over about a 500 uh, 500 different people over a period of about 40 days, he just kept telling them and revealing himself to different people, proving that he was the Messiah, and started to tell stories about why he had to do what he needed to do and how we can have life through him. And so one of the first things that he was doing in his 40-day period is he has an, a discussion with Peter. Peter was one of his uh, uh, disciples who had the most potential but also brought a bunch of problems with him as well. You ever know that people who have the most potential always bring along a bunch of problems, and Peter was just like that. Maybe you resonate with Peter, that you have a lot of potential in your life, but you also have a baggage of problems. And Jesus has this interaction with Peter, so much potential. Even earlier in the story, Jesus actually spoke over Peter's life. His name was Simon, meaning shaking, shaky sand. Jesus actually gave him a new name, said, from this day forward, I'm going to call you Peter. Peter means rock. And he said, Peter, I'm going to build my church on your life. You're going to be a crucial element to the advancement of this gospel. And Jesus spoke that over him. He said, the gates of hell is not even going to prevail against the church that I'm going to build through you. And so Peter, being prophesied and spoken over by Jesus, saying that he's going to be rock, had some shaky experiences in his life. Shaky warrior. And Peter had one of his most shaky moments in public where he denied Jesus publicly three times. One of the homeboys who was down with Jesus, actually Jesus' prime disciple, denied him publicly in front of a bunch of pe different people. And imagine that failure that Peter must have felt in that moment. Jesus actually said, you're going to deny me. And Peter said, I'm never going to do that. Maybe you're here tonight and you find yourself in a position like that where you are at a place in your life right now that you never thought you would be. I would never, ever do that. And you find yourself doing the very thing that you never thought you would do. Maybe you're at this point right now. I never thought my life was going to be like this. It's my third relationship, and this, even this relationship that I'm in isn't even going anywhere. 
And you would never have thought years ago that your life would be at this place. Maybe, oh, I thought my life would be so much more better, this, different things, I'll be doing a lot of different other things in my life, but you're not doing those very things and you're actually doing the very opposite. Peter was in that very place. Never thought he was gonna be in that situation, but he found himself in the midst of his failure, denying Jesus publicly three times. And the great thing I love about Jesus is that he never places the period where, he, where there should be a comma, meaning that he always is continuing to write our story. So don't ever put a period over your life where God wants it to be a comma. This God that we serve is the God that wants to continue to write your story, meaning that if you're still alive today, your story is not yet finished. So don't ever continue to give up on this God that is continuing to write your story in your life right now. Don't ever give up on this heavenly Father who is continuing to write your story because it is not over. It is just beginning. It is just beginning. Somebody needed to hear that. Your story is not yet ended. It's only beginning. When you put your faith and trust in God, he's going to continue to unfold his plans and purposes over your life. And Peter's story is exactly like you and I. His story didn't end. But Christ had a plan and purpose for him. And I love a good story. And I love the fact that Peter, even in the midst of his failure, continued to find hope in this Savior. And the thing I love about God is he's constantly writing our story. And the way that he writes our story is by loving us in our failure and leading us through them. That's what Jesus did with Peter. He loved them. He met him right where he was. And we're going to pick up this story in John chapter 21, and Jesus is having another interaction with Peter. After he resurrected, this is one of the interactions that he had. He says uh, in verse 20, uh, John chapter 21, verse 15, he says this, when they had finished eating, I love the fact that Jesus always has a meal before he has a serious conversation. Get some food in you so you're not grouchy, and then let's discuss some things. So he put some food into Peter, and then they have this conversation. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than your failure? Do you love me more than the situation that you're in? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, then take care of my sheep. The third, third time, uh, he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was so hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. You know, this entire interaction, not once did Jesus bring up the failure. Not once. So if Jesus doesn't bring it up, then we shouldn't bring it up either in our lives. But I think I realized about us when we experience failure, that's the very thing that we keep talking about in our lives. We keep bringing it up. We, we actually have our failures in our lives and we walk around with it like it's a trophy. Like, yeah, this is, a, this is me. This is my life. This is all I'm ever going to be. And we start identifying ourselves with our failure. Let me tell you this. Failure is never a person. It's only just a situation in your life. Don't begin to identify yourself with your failure because that's not you. Your failure is not you. It doesn't have to be you. You don't have to identify with your failure. It's just a moment in your life. It doesn't have to be who you are. Because when we're in Christ, we are more than our failures. We're not even, he doesn't even look at us through the lens of our failures. So don't begin to identify with that because Christ never even brought this up in his interaction with Peter. Never did. So stop bringing it up in your life. Move on from it. Move on. Jesus didn't even lecture Peter. Say, hey, what are you doing? I told you. Why did you do that? Peter didn't get lectured. Peter didn't, didn't experience any negative repercussions all Jesus did was reaffirm his love for him. When he asked Peter, do you love me? He was basically saying that, I love you, Peter. I love you in spite of your failure. I love you so much that I'm not even going to bring it up. He was reaffirming his love for Peter. And the thing I realized about Jesus is he was restoring Peter using the motivation of love. You know, there's so many different motivators in our lives. And the two main ones that we can use that'll get us to do a lot of different things are fear and love. These are two powerful motivators in our lives. And these different motivators will get you to do different things, but it will produce different fruits in our lives. Fear would always lead to obligation, but love would always lead to obedience. And Jesus used the motivation of love. He said, no, Peter, I love you. I love you so much. He said it three times, one for every single denial. That if in case, Peter got worried, 
And in case Peter forgot, Jesus said, no, I'm going to reaffirm my love for you three different times, basically saying that my love for you covers those three denials in your life, covers those mistakes. And that's what the Bible says, that Jesus' love for us covers a multitude of sins, even failures in our lives. And so Jesus uses this motivation of love, and, and what he does in this moment is he points him outward. He says, if you really... If you receive my love to the fullest, then you're going to take your eyes off of yourself and you're going to help somebody. You know, the thing I realize is that when we go through failures, the very thing that we do is we go inward and we start thinking about myself. I got to fix me. I got to get my act together. <laughs> my moke's coming out, sorry. <clears throat> together. Uh, I got to get, I got to do me. I got to get myself, my stuff fixed. And Jesus does the, does the exact opposite. No, the way that you overcome failure is not by focusing on yourself. It's actually by focusing on other people. It's by getting your eyes off of yourself and start helping other people. Jesus took them out of his mistakes and pointed them to the mission, meaning that the way that you get over your failure is not by focusing on you, but it's about focusing on the things that God has for you, putting your eyes on him and allowing him to use your life to minister to other people. You, come, you overcome your hurt by helping other people. You get free as you start to feed other people. That's how God uses us to get over our failures and he doesn't want us to stay what we are at i love the fact that even in this context that if we were to think about how jesus wanted to build this church he could have used a bunch of different of these disciples and he could have used john who actually went with jesus all the way to the cross and never denied him publicly and in my head if i was the jesus and i was discipling different peter peter would probably be the last guy because i'm like man you left me when i needed you the most Man, right when I needed you, that's when you deserted me. I'm not going to build my church on you. I'm going to build my church on someone else. But Jesus was proving a point by choosing Peter. And his point was this, that if I can build my church on a guy who made so many mistakes like Peter, imagine what I can do in your life. He was making a point. He was saying that I, most people would probably think I'm going to build this church on John who had it all together, but no, I'm going to do the exact opposite. I'm going to prove my glory and my power by using the most unworthy person and using him to build my church. Imagine what God can do through your life. If you feel unworthy right now, that means that God has a plan and purpose for your life that you need to experience and trust him in. Don't ever disqualify yourself because it is God who qualifies us for his purposes and plans for our lives, not yourself. It's the kind of God that we serve. And so Jesus had to lead, lead uh, Peter, get your eyes off of yourself and start feeding other people. Feeding other people. You know, we have a, an amazing story tonight of someone who actually experienced this in the flesh. And her name is Patricia Carvalho. And uh, she's my homegirl. And she has an amazing story. And before we get into her story, point your attention to the screens. And you're going to hear her story unfold. My name is Patricia Carvalho. I um, work currently as a staff member of Grace Bible Pearlside, helping at the youth ministry. Part of the things I do every day is go into different campuses and I teach all our young adults, men and women, how to be able to properly train our student leaders to um, reach out to their friends. When I grew up in the Philippines, my mom never really took track of the men that would come in and out of our house. And when that happened, um, I remember being abused or sexually molested by um, her friends and it happened repetitively in my family by different men and from six years old onwards i was sexually abused and molested for about a decade of my life my mom got into a relationship with my stepdad and um, i remember again having being molested by my stepdad and at 14 um, when my mom went to visit another country it left the opportunity for him to be alone with me and so that's when he raped me i would think that running to my mom for protection and telling her that these things are happening that she would have done something about it and she said you know um for the sake of the family and for the sake of the unit of the family i can't do anything and what happens is i get into a relationship and um i get pregnant the the, the guy he leaves me the day that he finds out i was pregnant and so I ran, to, I ran to church. The more and more that I started knowing about him, the more and more that his love started to melt all those walls in my heart away. And um, one of the biggest challenges for me was really uh, reading in his word. And he says, you know, how, now I've forgiven you, now go and forgive others. But when he began to challenge me 
about forgiving others, I was like, wait, you mean forgiving those who abuse me? Forgiving those who hurt me? Forgiving my son's dad that left me and left me for, for you know, and, and hasn't even said hi to my son? And oh, that really like was stretching me as a Christian. And I was actually, I was actually able to, um, to confront my parents and especially my stepdad and my mom and forgive them face to face and I told them you know I forgive you even when they weren't sorry I said I forgive you and what I love about that is that God was able to take that and turn it around and I actually still have a very good relationship with my mom till this day and my stepdad I, I still talk to him he walked me down the aisle when I was married and you know the story that I share is not just for me but it's for those the women that are watching the women that are hearing this for me to be able to share that it's only he could have done this. Can we all welcome Patricia to the stage as she shares an amazing story? This is my girl. She, this is her, like, she's been speaking at all of our services this weekend, and she has a powerful story. And uh, if you've heard it before, we're going to take a different route because she has so much depth to her story that we're going to take a little different angle, and, uh, and you look at that screen and you hear that story, it's, it's easy to just kind of be seeing this, the, the after product and be like, ah, oh, that was just a, uh, that looks nice, but you don't know where I'm at right now, and there's probably people here tonight who are maybe in a situation that you've exper experienced before, and there's one thing to just kind of experience failure in the past and leave it in your past, but how many know that sometimes your failure can actually be in your present? in your life, and I want to ask you this, Patricia, just kind of off the cuff, we do a little uncensored version of this uh, story, but, um, you know, with your son, the way that he was born, was he a constant reminder of your failure in the past? Um, you know, when, when, when I had Christian, I remember feeling the, the feeling of having a stigma on you, the fact that there was a constant reminder that you got pregnant and the guy left you and he didn't want you, you weren't enough. You aren't enough to be, to, to, for even the father to sign the birth certificate. I mean, it, that's how bad it was. And I remember just having to go through that feeling of rejection, feeling of abandonment. I mean, it was one thing on top of another, aside from the abuse and the rape and to have to go through that. And, and knowing that my son, he doesn't know his dad and, and, and living that out, I think that to me was a constant reminder of of the fact that there was, I, I failed in that area. And I wanted a good family. I wanted, I wanted a complete family. And yet when he left me, it was repetitive. It was a broken family all over again. And I was asking God, why? Why would you allow these things to happen to me? And I remember I started following God when I was pregnant. So um, in that I was thinking, oh, I'm just gonna get married one day and, and, and you know, soon and fix this family and it'll complete it. And that's what's gonna complete me. But God had other plans and he began to work in me and through me in that situation of being a single mom without having a significant other to know who I was and my identity in Christ before he ever allowed me to marry my husband. And so for, for that period of God working in you, I mean, you can see the polished story at the end, but that period was over a, a span of years, about 12 years that you had a season of singleness where God was working in you. But during those 12 years, you had to be both the mother and the father, raise this the son of yours, and just tell us how, how you even got through that entire process because you can see that if you're trying to raise a son that is a constant reminder of your failure, how do you actually push past that? Well, I think knowing, knowing that God is a God of second chances and knowing that he can take your story and turn it around and use it really for his glory, I think that to me had given me hope that it doesn't matter what had happened to me. It doesn't matter if I was abused. It doesn't matter if I was raped. It doesn't matter if I was left behind because the word says that I have a second chance in him. I have a new life in him. And it's not just for me, but for my son. And I mean, reading the word and reading how God's heart is, he has a, he's a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows and orphan. I mean, when I read that, I was like, wow, this God, he defends me. Wow. He loves me. And he doesn't just love me. He loves this boy so much that he's willing to fix his mama and get her act straight so that he can grow up in a home that loves him and, and, and that he has the values of the Bible and Christian values to grow up with. I mean, statistics say that parents... Uh, 
children to grow up in single parent homes, especially if they don't know their fathers, the kids end up being a wreck. And so I was like, no, that's not going to happen to my son. I'm going to raise him and I'm going to do whatever it takes in me to be able to raise him in such a way that is godly and has values. And it was hard. There were days when I was crying. There were days when it was just all snot up. God, why? Why is this happening to me? Why? Why? I feel so alone. I feel so ashamed. And then when I was in LA, I actually... Um, Okay, when I was in LA, there was actually a season where I tried to get my, my visa and it never happened. And so I actually became an illegal alien living here in America. And so I couldn't even Shh, get a don't job. Tell anyone, Shh, yeah. Don't be telling nobody. No, no, no. I, can't, I couldn't get a job anywhere. I couldn't even get a job as a janitor. I couldn't even get a job to clean houses. And so there was a time where I couldn't afford rent. So we had to sleep in people's homes and we had to sleep on the floor. And I was watching my son sleep on a couch and I was broken. To me, I was like... God, I came from a rich family in the Philippines. I come here to America and I'm living poor and I'm trying to follow you and I'm trying to make disciples for you and I'm trying to raise my son. Why are these things happening? And I didn't realize that God was beginning to prune me out of self-sufficiency and pride and my insecurities of being a single mom. And he was putting in me a deposit of, of a stamp of approval because of what Christ has done. And he began to wash over me with his love and he began to wash away the insecurity, but, but, but he gave me a kind of security that, is, that can only be found in him. Mm. But I had to allow that process to happen. And I think I love about Patricia in this, this story is with her background, it could have been easily, she could have easily just bounced around from relationship to relationship to fill that void in her life. And many people do with that background coming from a broken home that you kind of begin to repeat the failures in your past again and it kind of affects your life but you didn't do that you made a choice to continue to trust God you didn't want to take things into your own hands you trusted him and then he brought uh, your current husband into your life and and even that was a constant reminder of your failure and God had to manifest something else in your life tell us about that story so um so I had been a Christian for about 10 years no yeah, 12 years already. And I didn't really date. You know, I became like this strong single mom. No man, I don't care about a man. I'm okay, I you know, self-sufficient. Little did I know. <laughs> little did I know that that was my fear. Like I was so fearful of men and I didn't want my son to grow up with a stepdad because my stepdad was the one who hurt me. Wow. And so I was acting out in in my own insecurities and and i remember coming out here for a short mission trip now if you guys have never been on a mission trip and you're single that's the way <laughs> go out on a mission trip and work for me Hello, somebody. But i came out here for a mission trip Sign me up obeying today. god making disciples I'm, I'm building small groups and and when i got here i met john and um my i guess you can just throw a picture of my family but i met john and I remember hearing his story for the first time and he was telling me that he got saved when he was 19 years old and has believed God for a wife ever since. And then when he told me that he lived purely for God, was a virgin, I was taken aback by that. And I said, God, you would give me a man that is so pure and yet look at me, look at my past. I mean, I have a son, how could he accept my son? How could he accept my story? How could that be okay for him? And God began to remind me the way I see you is the way I see him. That there's no difference between the both of you and that I see you purely just the same way. And that was like a redemption of God in my life because my real dad's name is actually John. My, my stepdad's name is John. And so the fact that God gave me a new John to give me a new symbol of new life and, and a fresh start, that, that is just the power of God to be able to bring full circle of redemption. Wow, I didn't even know that part of the story. <laughs> and, and, and even just how you folks got married and God started to redeem all of the past in this moment, just at your wedding, and you made a choice to do different things to glorify him. Tell us about how God started to really bring to the fullness the story that he was writing all along for these 12 years. When, um, when we got married, my, my, husband, my son was supposed to walk me down the aisle because, you know, he was, he was the man in my life and I wanted him to walk me down the aisle and have that honor. And I remember at our wedding day, um, I felt a nudge in my spirit 
to say, invite your dad to walk you down the aisle. And you know, I had already forgiven him. I had already, he had asked forgiveness actually from what he's done and I was able to, um, to forgive him fully and not hold a grudge against him. But I didn't feel there was a need to actually for him to walk me down the aisle. But during that day, I felt a nudge and it was like, invite him because it's a full circle. It's such a closure of what happened to you in your past. And, um, and so I actually asked him, I said, you know, would you like to walk me down the aisle? And his face was all like smiling. He was like, wow, yes, I'd love to. And, and just right there, having him stand by me and having my son who knows what happened, he knows that his grandfather, what his grandfather did to me and having my husband waiting there down the aisle, smiling, all at the same time, watching this redemption of, 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 of forgiveness, of love and relationship. And it was just a, the ability of God to be able to take a relationship that was once broken, that was once messed up, and bring it into a new future. It was like my ch the chapter of my life was being rewritten, and be, it was made new because of what Christ has done. It's, isn't that an amazing story? Like, who... No one in their right mind could actually write a story like that. Only God can. Only God can bring to full completion what the enemy used for evil. God had turned it around for good. And, and her life is a living proof that we serve an amazing God. Only God can do something like that in our lives. And the same God that has worked a miracle in her life is the same God that wants to work a miracle in all of our lives. It doesn't matter what kind of failure you're in or what kind of situation that you're in. This God and do a turnaround in your life and start to rewrite the story of your life as well. And so, Patricia, tonight, why don't you just encourage us and leave us with something, just impart to us how we can turn the page in our lives and allow God and trust God for our future. I just want to encourage everyone here that your past doesn't define you. Whatever it is that you, were, you did, whatever it is that was done towards you, you can let that go. You don't have to hold on to it. You don't have to make it your identity. You don't have to wear that identity every day because Christ has paid such a high price, not just for the forgiveness of your sins, but your freedom. The Bible says that she whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And I want to encourage everybody here today, you have to walk out in that freedom because that's what the Holy Spirit can do in our lives. You know, so many people walk around defeated. There should be a difference between people that aren't Christians and people that are. That even through our trials, even through our pain, we can smile around, we can have joy because we know that we have hope. There's a hope anchored in our soul to know that Christ was able to do above and beyond what we could ever ask or imagine for us. And now that we can reciprocate that love to him and actually be the hope to other people, you know, so many of your friends need to hear about this hope. So many of your family members need to hear about this hope that is found in Christ and only you can bring that hope to them. So open your mouth just like Peter, stand up and go and make disciples. Feed people with the gospel of truth because the world is desperate, desperate to hear hope and redemption Ooh. don't let her get into her zone man she'll preach the house down tonight as you were sharing i just had this thought that when you used to look at your son it used to remind you of your failure but now when you look at your son it's a reminder of the favor of god on your life when you make a choice to trust him with your future how god can take a failure and through his grace change it and that same failure can turn into the favor of God. So thank you so much for who you are, and I'm so glad that she's on our team. She's on my staff.